again. Still happy to see you here, and also happy May Day. May is going to be a, a very busy month. It always it seems like, isn't it? Uh, depending on, on where you live, May 1st or the first Monday of May is celebrating the coming of spring and summer. And just so you know, uh, there's only 51 days till the first day of summer. So, yeah. Uh, I probably should, no, I don't guarantee none of that. But that's God's business. Just the forecaster. Uh, yeah. As fast as the year's going, I probably shouldn't check them days off like that. But, uh, but anyhow, as we continue through the month, May 5th, this coming Thursday, is the National Day of Prayer. Uh, we're going to look at that in just a moment. May 8th is Mother's Day. Thank you, ladies, for all you do and have done for us. May 30th is Memorial Day, and we thank you, veterans, for all that you've done. So, May is going to be a very busy month. Last week, we finished a series entitled Jesus. And we were on that for quite a while as we walked through the scriptures and seen all the, the different aspects of, of Jesus' character and who he was and also what God the Father sent him to do, the accomplishment he made. And I believe that we learned a lot about our Lord and Savior through that study. We finished last week with a sermon entitled What Now? about what happened after the resurrection up to the ascension of Jesus Christ. And, and what we as, as God's children and believers should be continuing to do from that now forward. So, just so you know how it works with the pastor, whenever a series is going on, and I love, as you, if you've been here a while, you know I love to preach by series. Man, them guys that every week or every Sunday morning and Sunday night got a whole different topic going in on. Bless their hearts, man. <laughs> I, can't, I love to preach in series. I, I do. I think, I think we hang on to God's Word better that way, in my opinion. Okay. Um, but when we're, we're in a series, I'm always praying, God, what now? What do you want us to do next? Where do we go from here? And God is very faithful in, in leading and directing what we do. Uh, just as an example, he allowed that Jesus series to run through the entire Lenten season as we were coming along with it and uh, all the way through the resurrection. And, and through that particular period of time, and I've heard this before from, from folks here in, in the flock that uh, make the comment that, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. Or I'm not sure that I'm praying right. And uh, so uh, the next series is going to be prayer. We're going to talk about prayer for a period of time and, and what God's Word's got to say about that. So, but again, look at God's timing. The time to start a new series on prayer is just four days before the National Day of Prayer. So as we look at that, I want to address the you know, God in His goodness. God is good, isn't He? Amen? Amen. 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 He guides everything that happens in this ministry. Um, so uh, we just got so much to praise Him for. So I want to talk a minute about uh, what is the National Day of Prayer? The National Day of Prayer is an annual day of observance held on the first Thursday of May. Designated by the United States Congress, when people are asked to turn to God in prayer and meditation, the president is required by law to sign a proclamation each year encouraging all Americans to pray on that specific day. It's a call for all people of different faiths in the United States to pray for the nation and its leaders. It is, however, not a national holiday, okay? It is, so everybody's got to go to work on Thursday, okay? So, um, but is the National Day of Prayer something new? Well, no, it's not. The first official day of prayer in the United States was in 1775, when the Continental Congress called the public to fast and to pray for the leadership of the colonies. That was 247 years ago. 
So it's not. But the National Day of Prayer isn't just patriotic. It's also biblical. Uh, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, God's Word says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. So God calls us to do this. And the First Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul in A.D. 64. A.D. 64. That was 1,958 years ago. God wins again, doesn't he? That was 1,711 years prior to the Continental Congress. So it really isn't new, a new idea. It's something God gave us. So the question from this becomes, does our country and its leaders need prayer? No. If the answer wasn't so sad, that'd be a laughable question, wouldn't it? But we know how much it needs prayer. Of course it does. I want to share with you an email I got from the Alliance Defending Freedom. It's just couple short paragraphs, okay? Um, and we are members of the Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, it's a group of, uh, like a think tank full of lawyers, and, and they do, uh, if somebody come and said, uh, Pastor Brown, you have to do a same-sex wedding or you can't have this church, these people would come and, and help defend that, that we don't have to do that, okay? So let me read this, and then we'll, we'll move forward. Freedom's dependence on prayer. As we prepare to comm commemorate the National Day of Prayer on May 5th, it is imperative that we are mindful of the arduous but worthwhile task of transmitting freedom to the next generation. We must fully embrace this task if we wish to leave our posterity with an America that shines as a beacon of freedom. As hostility toward God, given freedoms, expands in our culture and institutions, the critical moment requires our undivided attention. Our children and grandchildren bear the brunt of hostile actions against the virtues of freedom. They're being taught to embrace ideologies that directly oppose their freedom. Secular ideologies in academia and entertainment industry, among other places, are sowing confusion among children and young adults by twisting their perception of biological realities, societal norms, and religious activity. This constant onslaught of indoctrination has led to outcomes such as teens identifying as atheists, doubling the number of that of adults. And almost 21% of Gen Z identify as LGBT. Gen Z is 10 to 25 years. Despite the formidable challenges that lie before us, there is still time to preserve freedom for future generations of America. There is no better solution to these challenges than prayer. Past spiritual awakenings in America share the common prerequisite of Christians possessing an insatiable desire to pray until God moved in their generation. For this year's National Day of Prayer, let us dedicate our churches as houses of prayer that will seek to secure generational wins that will transform culture for future generations. That's the end of their quote there. Um, but we can see how important it is. Most of us here have, have lived enough years that we look back and we talk about the good old days, right? And how much life has changed in our lifespan. And all of this is happening as it's set here. Most of my working career, I work and been involved with numbers and statistics and stuff like that, and I, I love that kind of stuff. So bear with me a minute as I share some of this. The, in 2014, this was the most current one I could find. There may be another one, but this is the only, as far as I could find. 
The Pew Research Center, okay, in 2014 was eight years ago, and we know from eight years ago to today, things are worse now than they were then. 22.8% of the American population is religiously unaffiliated. Unaffiliated. No church, no denomination, no, no doing that stuff. 3.1% of the American population in 2014 was atheist. 4% was agnostic. Now, so you have a definition from the Oxford Dictionary. Atheist is a person who disbelieves or lacks belief in the existence of God or gods. No God whatsoever, no spiritual being at all. And the agnostic is a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence of or nature of God or anything beyond the material phenomena. A person who claims neither faith nor disbelief in God. Now, that's some numbers, but to put, we'll take that one step farther. In 2020, the population of the United States of America was 329.5 million people. That's a lot of people, right? So if you take the, the percentages from 2014, which we know these numbers would be higher today, that is 75,126,000 unaffiliated people. No religious affiliation. It's 1.2 million atheists and 1.3 million agnostics. So you add that up, that adds up to 77.6 million people who are unaffiliated or having nothing to do with God in the United States of America. So you take that 77.6 million and you subtract that from 329.5 million and you end up with this number, 251.9 million who profess to be ethnic Christians. Why aren't we in better shape? This is a question that comes from that. Why aren't we in better shape? So, with those numbers, and, and like I said, I, I really enjoy that kind of stuff, maybe you know, but anyway, um, it's an important, 251 million people, we outnumber them almost four to one. But yet, the world's winning. Scripture tells us prayer is the answer. And we need to be about it. You know, uh, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9 that there's nothing new under the sun. He says this, What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. All these things that we're walking through today have been walked through before. The Romans went through it. Other countries and, and that have been victims that went through this. So, where does the confusion come from? If there's that many professing Christians in the United States of America, where does the confusion come from? Well, it comes from leadership that doesn't follow or acknowledge God or His Word. <clears throat> That's why we pray for them. Now, I know there's a lot of people, and, and I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about what God tells us in His Word, that we need to pray for the leadership. We need to pray for those roles, right? That God will use them, and that the people put there will use them in the right way. I'm going to mention just two top spots in our country, okay? President Joe Biden kept professing Catholic. For a period of time, the U.S. Cardinals said that he couldn't receive communion because he wasn't even standing. And then he went to Rome, met with the Pope, and the Pope said, oh, he's good old boy, and he's in good standing, and he absolved him, and he's able to have communion. But, but, he still advocates for pro-abortion and pro-LGBTQ. That's just two examples 
of not living or following God's word. Where does the confusion come from? If the leaders in this country were following God's word and his ways, the country will follow. Even, even so they, they aren't theologians. But what about the Ten Commandments? Half my family is Catholic. My whole big family, you know. And they all got the Ten Commandments hanging every place you look. What about thou shalt not kill? But the president... He's, he's an advocate for, for abortion. So that's the top one in our country. And again, I'm not trying to make this political. This is what God's Word says and why we need to pray for these people. Examples of that. The second position, the vice president, Kamala Harris, professes to be a Baptist. Her mother was a Hindu. Her father was a Christian. She grew up attending a black Baptist church in a Hindu temple, both. Her husband is Jewish. She speaks in her uh, acceptance speech, she made this statement. Faith is about the way we live our lives, do our work, and pursue our callings. What about the commandment that says we shall have no other gods before me? Again, number two spot in our country. Not following God's word or God's ways. And again, it doesn't take much theology to, to read that and understand that God wants to be number one in our lives. Yet with all that going on, she is very much an advocate of pro-abortion and pro-LGBT. So just in two offices, and just those two examples of not following God's word, Where's the confusion come from? When, when I was growing up, going to school, and, uh, we taught our boys, you look up to your leaders, right? God puts them in place, and, and you're supposed to, they're supposed to be the example, and you're supposed to follow them. So, it's just some of the problem. You see, and here's the deal, most likely a nation not led by the word of God or the will of God, it won't be a godly nation. And there's a lot of other teachings and readings that proclaim that. We all just finished that, that book, uh, um, We Will Not Be Silent, right? And that's that addressed that fact. The, the leadership, it, got to, it needs to come. So we need to pray for these people. So that's kind of the problem, right? And we all know, we all know America's a mess right now. We know that. But what's the solution? Well, it's stated in that email that there's no better solution to these challenges than prayer. We need to pray. The country's been in trouble before. People have prayed, and, and eventually God moves, and there's revival, and it comes back. Don't you as citizens really want to live in a country that's one nation under God? Rather than following the, the world's ways, Satan's ways, ways of unbelief, where when people profess to be a Christian, they're, they're studying their Bibles, they're coming to church, they're seeking God's face in the decisions they're making. That's what the needs to be. So there are some answers. I have a list of scripture now. You probably thought, man, isn't he ever going to share any other scripture? But there are scriptures that speak to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses uh, 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. The apostle wrote this for the Lord. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Prayer. God's word promises that if we pray, if we take it to him, our words will have divine power. 
as we call him into it. In Jude, verses uh, 20 through 23, the word says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Do others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Prayer. It says here, we build ourselves up in the hope, praying in the Holy Spirit. That means we're right with God when we do that. You know, uh, I don't want you to think that I'm against people who claim to be LGBT. It's not the people, it's the sin. It's Satan's work in our world, in our society. So that's what we're, we, we have a problem with. It's not the people, okay? And in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, God's word says this. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us as we pray. Sometimes this gets so overbearing and, and so heavy and, and uh, so weird in our head that, that we don't know what to say. We just start praying. The Holy Spirit knows our heart. And he intercedes and, and translates to God in God's language. What we, what we are saying, what we're actually praying for. If we look at Psalm chapter 6 and verse 9. King David writes this. He's been in trouble. Things haven't gone his way. And in chapter 6 and verse 9 of Psalms, he writes, The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. He does it if we're not in right relationship. He cannot hear our prayers if we're, if we're living in sin, if we're not following his words, if we have unconfessed habitual sin, God doesn't hear our prayers. <coughs> Turns his ears from them. That's why it's so important that we constantly check ourselves with God's word. Am I in right standing with the Father? Then he'll hear my prayers. He'll hear your prayers. He'll hear our prayers. It's about obedience and trust. If we're in obedience, following God, and trusting that he will hear our prayers and he will respond to them. That's God's promise. That's why it's written in his, in his holy word. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. We should always be talking God's word. We should always be sharing this with our children. The, that the world is wrong. They need to know that. And we can't be bashful about it. God's word and God's ways have changed our family so much. You guys know my story. From drunk to preacher, the whole thing. Anyhow, our family, because of the way I live, prior to giving my life to Christ and, and dedicating that to, to studying and following him, 
our family began to change. Today, when we gather together for anything, a birthday or whatever, you know, they say, Pop, come on, pray before we eat. So we can eat. Yeah. And, and that's, that's different. Uh, they uh, have learned that when they come to our house, their language gets cleaned up. They're all, you know, I got adult grandchildren and that, and they all work in the world and everything. They know a lot of dirty words. You know, one of them is even my youngest son's an ex-Marine, and he really knows them good. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but they know our house is different. And that's what we need to be sharing with our children and our grandchildren. We have a great granddaughter now. The difference. It's in me. We keep her one day a week. Sharp and I do. I play guitar not well. And I sing with her, but not well. But what I teach in her how she's she's 15 months old now, and I'm teaching her Jesus loves me. Those are the things we do with our children. That's what the scripture tells us. I didn't do that. When, when uh, my boys were little, I was a drunk biker, and they knew all the nasty poems that I knew in that and stuff. You know? And that's just the way life was then. But it, God's word, in God's world changed that. And that's what we need to do, not just at my house, but with society, with your house. Because that's where it starts. None of us are too old to begin turning that around. We have to share with those under our influence. And I don't care who you are here today, there's somebody under your influence. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's your grandchildren. Maybe it's your parents. There are rebellion parents, you know, as well as young people. Friends, your prayers are the answer to the crisis America's in now. And the National Day of Prayer just brings that forward. So please, pray for the leaders of this country. You don't have to vote for them. Scripture don't say that. Don't say vote for them. It says pray for them. Pray that God will get their heart. You know, when I think about this and I speak about this, Remember when 9-11 happened? Out on the Capitol steps was all the senators and representatives, everybody out there singing Amazing Grace and prayer. Wouldn't that be something if that was the daily thing before they went to work inside? Wouldn't this country be different? What if your neighborhood was doing that? Speaking of God, praying for one another before you went about doing your neighbor. What about your own home? Do you pray together? Do you mention things like this? I know we all want to drag the leadership of the country through the mud. I'm guilty of that myself, you know. And, and we, we do that. But we need to be part of the solution. And that's what the National Day of Prayer is about. Now, for those of you who think you don't know how to pray, or don't or question whether you're doing it right, we're going to continue now with the series on prayer and what God's Word says about it and what our Savior Jesus Christ says about it. Because we definitely want God to hear these words. We definitely want Him to accept our prayers and to put His hand back on this country. It needs it. It needs it greatly. And God loves this country. He has blessed it in so many ways. I, don't get me wrong, I'm not against America. I love being America, man. You don't got to watch the news, the world news, only for a couple minutes and you'd be real grateful you're here where you're at. So we need to strive to do that. Take our leaders, our leaders, our leaders in the government, our leaders in the schools, our leaders in our families and our churches, all need to be lifted up to God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and as we look ahead here to the National Day of Prayer, we pray that every day, Father, could become a National Day of Prayer. That our leaders would be lifted up. Father, I pray that you 
Send the Holy Spirit. He grabbed hold of their heart. They, they all say they're connected. Father, to you, I pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them that your word and your will is a way that not only their lives, but this country should grow. Father, I pray that you will grant your mercy on us, that the finished work of Jesus Christ would shine all across the United States of America. Father, we pray the blood of Jesus Christ over America today. And all the things that have happened as the country and the society has seemed to walk away from you. Father, I pray you'll call them back. I pray, Father, that we might be leaders in that. Father, we just cry out of the bottom of our hearts that you will help us today to be shining examples of people trying to live Christian lives. Share our values with our communities and our families. And Father, we all know we need your help to do that. We thank you, Father, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to take care of our sin death problem. We thank you, Father, that you sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us and lead us and guide us. And we thank you for your written word that is our instruction manual on how we should live. Father, we want you to know that we do love you and adore you. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.